You know we can talk for hours. You know we can talk for hours, believe it. Yeah. Okay, we'll go right into it. So let me practice uh, saying your guys' names. Cromwell Burgos. Milhan, how do you say your last name properly? And, how, and your first name, too. Milan Baic, but I go by Milan Baic because in Serbo Croatian, most people can't pronounce it. Yeah. So for the last 27 years, I've uh, uh, people know me as Milan, except if you're from the Balkans, or you can pronounce that L and J as Milan. Yeah, Milan. Then, yeah that's it... actually pretty good. Yeah. Baic. Like by each number. Yeah, and by did I did I I didn't tell you Chrome, but I have a cousin that his last name is Da Beach. Da Beach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Getting, the show's getting better now. Milian Baich. Yeah. Milian Baich. I love that. Milian Baich. Cromwell. Yeah. Bourgeois. 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 Bougie. Cromwell. Bougie. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome to have you guys both on. So uh I appreciate that. And I'll just uh share a story about Cromwell that I, I still remember so vividly. We were teaching uh some executives and some leaders in the company uh the A3 process for problem solving. And it, at one point Cromwell and he's just amazing. Like you could see like how good of a student I am of his. I'm I'm one of I'm one of your good students, Crom. Don't you forget that. No, I'm your student. Because I remember what he taught and he he always used to say this is a this is a chromism that he stole from somebody else, but he would tell us that if the student hasn't taught the teacher, if the if the te- if the student hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught, right? He said that, Yep. But that's not what uh, I was going to share. <laughs> I was gonna share. He drew a line, so just imagine a straight line across, and maybe I'll maybe I'll just draw it, recreate it here. And he just wrote a little continuum, and he talked about leadership as being either you let everybody do whatever they want laissez-faire, like every, just give all your control away. And, and that's a, the extreme. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, he drew command and control. Like, just do what I tell you to do. He asked people, like he took his marker and he said, where are you on this continuum? Tell me when to stop my hand. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people were in the middle or a little more towards giving a little bit of empower, doing a little more empowerment. But mm-hmm. one person, and I won't name names, Crom, one person said, I am command and control. And that's where I'm happiest. I love to just tell people what to do. And I want to just be able to dictate to people. And that that makes me feel comfortable. And uh, and for that person to make that and admit that in this training was a breakthrough in of itself. And I know Cromwell's remembering mm-hmm. who it was now. And that person I watched over three years from that point forward change and grow when they realized, you know, what they what they were giving up by being so far to one extreme you know, versus the other. I think it goes back to what you guys said about the iceberg analogy, the four different lenses. It's all about what you can mm-hmm. see, what people can see. And sometimes we can't see ourselves and we need other people, situations or workshops like those that you're doing, Milian, to show people and help people see. Welcome to the EBFC show, the easier, better for construction podcast. I'm your host, Felipe Engineer Manriquez. This show is all about the business of construction. Today's episode is sponsored by Bosch Refine My Site is a cloud-based construction collaboration platform that applies lean principles to enable your entire team to plan, communicate, and execute in real time. It's the digital tool that works in tandem with your last planner system process and puts it all together in one simple collaborative ecosystem system. This easy-to-use platform is available in English, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and French and can be used on desktops, tablets, and mobile devices. According to Spencer Easton, Scheduling Manager at Oakland Construction, Refine My Site, in my opinion, is the best, leanest tool on the market for the last planet. Here's what our users have to say. We've looked at three other digital scheduling platforms and none compare to the straightforward approach Refine My Site takes. From milestone planning all the way down to daily tasks, this program gives every general contractor and their trade partners meaningful collaboration, accountability, and KPIs. Register today to try Refine My Site for free for 60 days. Today's show is also sponsored by the Lean Construction Institute. LCI is working to lead the building industry in transforming its practices and culture. Its vision is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes, 
every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Now, to the show. Welcome to the show, Milian Baich and Cromwell Burgos. Both of you are agilists, and Cromwell, we've known each other for so long. We have uh, Milian at a disadvantage because we are <laughs> we are absolutely like brothers, and anyone who knows us and has seen us working together, it is a sight to see. So I want to open it up to uh, introductions. We're going to let uh, the newest party member, Cromwell, introduce himself first. Milian, tell the good people of the EBFC show lots about yourself. Uh, so my journey has been really uh, 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 short and long. I grew up in Sarajevo during the uh, Civil War in, uh, in, in Bosnia. And uh, essentially, uh, my dad decided to leave after being in three concentration camps, decided to leave the area for you know, obvious reasons. And... Uh, he got drunk with his buddies back in, I don't know, 94, and applied to go to United States, Australia, Canada, wherever he could. And we ended up in the United States. It was the first call that we got. And uh, when we got here, I was a teenager. And uh, at that time, I worked at Circus City, but I also started building websites. And eventually, I got fired from Circuit City. And I continued building websites. And uh, <laughs> um, when I went to college, um, I when I thought I was going to be like a soccer player uh, coming from Europe and playing here, getting a scholarship, I thought, you know, that's what I want to do. But I always loved this idea of designing, building things. So in college, uh, I joined the uh, entrepreneurship program and they encouraged us to form entities and companies and start you know, being an, <laughs> uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, so back in 2002, I started working or started working for myself with a couple of buddies. We started this company called Millimax Group. And we were building websites at that time for anybody that wanted a website and we're happy to make money in college. And I wish I paid off the school loans instead of, spending it on uh, drinks and uh, uh, other stuff. Um, it, it, was, it was interesting uh, in a way that we started like networking with people. I, I went to school in Providence, Rhode Island, and we started networking with people in Providence. And one of our clients in Providence referred us to this uh, company in Lexington, Mass called Visible Systems. And uh, as college students, we didn't have any structure as far as like how we work. We would play games and then work, play games, work really late at night. And eventually uh, what happened, we started working with this uh, company, Visible Systems. They were doing some agile extreme programming and uh, some even daily standups, they would do daily standups. So I remember like we wouldn't go every day for the daily standups, we would join them like twice a week. Um, and that was something that, that was my first exposure to this concept of agile working. I think like by nature, the way that we did stuff was agile. And because this was a big company, they were trying to, they were mostly using waterfall or the uh, rest of the company was using waterfall approaches. So that was my first exposure <laughs> to Agile. Uh, and over the, I don't know now, last 20 years I've worked with large publicly traded companies, large uh, banks, insurance, uh, small startups, uh, 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 government agencies, uh, one that you are very familiar with, uh, which I won't name in California. Um, and uh, over the last five years, I've started working more and more with, uh, uh, with companies and people outside of software development industry. And hence I met Crom and we started talking and uh, uh, we had a lot in common as far as like, how do you, um, you know, look at organizational transformation and uh, what he was telling me about what's happening in the construction industry resonated with both of us in a sense like, yeah, it's a different industry, but there's a lot of you know, similar challenges um, that we're facing and trying to deal with. So uh, we've been talking and, and trying to think about how do we uh, bring some of this awareness because it feels like the constru construction companies about construction companies are about 10 years behind uh, generally speaking, in some of the stuff, in some of the stuff, they're really ahead. Uh, but there's, I think, a lot that the construction uh, industry can uh, learn from the software development industry. So we've been thinking and brainstorming what we can do to 
bring more awareness to to the construction industry. I appreciate that uh, kindness to the construction <laughs> industry. <laughs> it's uh, we say inside the biz, we're about twenty years behind adopting new trends and and, and techs. It's not to say that there aren't uh, a lot, lots of companies that are hyper focused on innovation and adopting new strategies and techniques, but there are far more in the middle that are uh, just been using traditions that have worked for a while that are t- tending not to work now. And so what an awesome way that you guys met and fast, fascinating background you have there. I definitely have some some questions brewing for you. I'm dying to hear Cromwell introduce himself. So Cromwell, take it away. Yeah, let me, uh, let me uh, pick up where Milhan left off. So when I met him, you know how it goes, right? There's always a wall and then you start drawing things. <laughs> and I start, I start drawing things. That's okay. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, that you have no idea. <laughs> Me and and then he starts taking the pen out of my hand and then try to like draw. He's like, "Oh, we we share the same thing here." And uh, that was that was really neat. I think we hit it off right away. Uh, Milhan is very focused on uh, something that is missing from my journey, and so. Uh, the, I, the, the, this whole thing about uh, lean started uh, early 2000, right? So I, I worked for a, a general contractor uh, that was all over California. And so we moved here in Sacramento from uh, the office uh, in, uh, in Irvine. And uh, uh, this is one of the more uh, progressive uh, general contractors, right? Uh, if, you, if you look at the list of clients that they have, uh, mostly Silicon Valley. I mean, during the time, 90% uh, repeat client, that, that's, that's unheard of, right? This yeah. company Still. started at guaranteed maximum price. Anyway, the, uh, this is the company where I learned all the basic, uh, the right things in, in construction as we know it, right? Uh, and as you go through your journey, I mean, there's opportunities and then uh, Sider Health uh, started on this lean journey. What if you trace all of this? It's probably gonna come back to Sider. <laughs> all, all of this, all of this tra- uh, transformation, right? Because that's when they say, "Hey, we, this is not sustainable." So they have billions of dollars in development, and they start uh, talking to all the general contractors. Anyway, long story short, there was a general contractor outside of California, uh, and. Uh, Sutter uh, 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 did a test, project was done, and they actually uh, uh, have savings, which is unheard of, right? And so uh, they were looking for somebody to lead in their uh, pre-construction in Sacramento. And uh, I was, I I never believe in this kind of things. Uh, uh, Previously, the first uh, Sutter got to get, I mean, it was like 2004, 2005, when they start talking about lean, I was probably very skeptic, right? Uh, integrated project delivery, because uh, construction is very. I mean, there's a lot of corruption, right? I mean, it's it, if you if you if you use trust, it, it's not gonna really. Anyway, that was like way back, like 20 years ago. Uh, long story short, uh, started my journey uh, in lean. Uh, very lucky to have a lot of mentors, right? That that uh, guide me through it. But there's, there's always that something missing, right? That you don't, uh, uh, looking back, right? And this is where uh, this agility in construction uh, that we, we, we came up with, I think would fill that gap, right? And because there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a gap out there in, in, in how, we, uh, how we impart learning uh, in the beginning, right? But anyway, so uh, I went from a project engineer to go in the office as pre-construction and then started to uh, uh, do other work, right? And uh, uh, started to uh, use different words, right? Like during the time when you use the word champion, it was like, what? Like people would say like, what are you talking about? Right now it's, it's very common, right? Uh, just different uh, uh, vernaculars and uh, uh, through the years, uh, I think back in, uh, was it 2011 or 2012, I started to come across, because uh, there was all these flyers, right, agile project management, and then started to do my own just testing of like a scrum framework, like to do doing done, 
and then that's when I met you, Felipe. Right? We we in, back in 2016. Yeah, right? we used to work together. The first right. time, Melian, you're gonna love it. The first time, yeah. I still have the picture, Cromwell, because I favorited it on my phone. <laughs> the first time I saw him near a whiteboard, it was like watching a planet get drawn into a black hole. Like <laughs> he had a marker in his hand, and he just went and started drawing. I will I will try to find the picture of Crom, and I will get it up. <laughs> on the screen so people could see him in his glory with the, the dry erase marker going to the board. And, and he literally, and this was the first time that, that I met you, you and I got to see you working. He knocked my socks off, ladies and gentlemen. He blew me away. <laughs> Unscripted, we did an all-day training in San Francisco, and we're in this office that was wall-to-wall -wall whiteboards, except for one art wall. It was like a feature art wall, but everywhere else <laughs> was whiteboard. And by the end of the eight-hour session, Cromwell had made sure that all of those whiteboard spaces were filled. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that was most amazing, I don't know if you remember this, Crom, but at the end, Milian, he found a little like one, one and a half foot square section that was still white. And yeah. he, he has a blue uh, dry erase marker. And he did a quick calculation. He, he turned around, he, he counted how many people were in the room, and he said... Oh, they hated that. <laughs> and he said, today... Today, we spent $25,000. What's going to be our return on the investment for our training today? And I was just like, oh, it's just an awe. Oh, like, that was the first time. I think in, in the 20 years that I'd been in construction, Crom, that was the first time somebody had said that training costs us money. <laughs> There's I mean, a lot of people. That's how we do it. Right? It's like, hey, yeah. it, it's an event. Right, we, you train and then people forget. They just show up, eat breakfast and lunch, and then, and then like, they, what's next? What's next? Yeah, and I think it's worth saying, Crom. Uh, and where are you working? Uh, if you don't mind, what, what do you? What? Oh, uh, so uh, 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 again, yeah. my journey uh, took me now into uh, a company that uh, does manufacturing, uh, and we still do general contracting. So we're now in this. Uh, uh, now I'm into this world of uh, productization. So. Uh, we're, we're now looking at markets rather than uh, projects. So the problem that, uh, uh, so I, the company is uh, uh, Clark Pacific. And so through the year, Clark Pacific has been around uh, 60 plus years. And uh, there's always a rump up and a rump down, right? Either in innovation or uh, just any project, right? And so projects like Apple and uh, Stanford, Escondido, these are millions and millions of square feet projects. But when they're done, I mean, now we start over, right? Right. So uh, what we're trying to do is now we're 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 looking at what is the mar the problem that the market is trying to solve, and then from there we would create those products, so that it's not a a project based approach, is a it's a uh, market based approach. So, an example is we're looking at uh, we have a product for a, a office building, we have a product for a, a parking garage, and then. Uh, in, in my case, we have a product for uh, student housing and dormitories and general housing, right? And then you, 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 you put some standard decision into these products, but then you leave some flexibility depending on your customer. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been an exciting journey as far as uh, learning. You realize that you have, there's, there's more out there, right? As far as you're learning. And so we're getting into agile product development, right? So there's, there's lean product and process development. They're very close, uh, but our precedent is more exposed to agile. That's why we're, we tend to, uh, to gravitate uh, to agile uh, development. So Yeah, and either one of you could just uh, paint the picture of agility and construction. What is it, where to come from? And of course, we will put uh, links in the show notes for anyone listening to get in contact with both of these amazing gentlemen Milian Baich and uh, Cromwell Burgo. Yeah. Check the show notes, people, because it's going to be there. They're pretty active on social media, one more than <laughs> other. You'll you'll figure out which one it is when you uh, start to follow them. And so, uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about agility and construction. I can share my my thoughts on it in a sense, like uh, you know, it's not just I, I think you know uh, agility and construction, agility, you know, in general, like you know, business agility. It's really like ability for organizations to be able to respond and i mean i mean just the actual because i'm looking at cromwell's picture 
Liliana, it's not a trick question. Like, I'm not on the next question. You're asking us about the. the, the I'm asking the, about the website the, you have and the, yeah, the, the and sure. the company you well, let, Let's maybe let's maybe yeah. uh, let, let's maybe define agility. Uh, uh, so let me just finish because it'll make more sense. Okay. Uh, I, I think so. In a sense, like because a lot of times we talk about agility, but what is really agility? And it's that ability for organization to respond, right? Uh, uh, and respond and benefit from change. Right. Um, so this ability to respond to change and benefit from change. You know, one, one good example is COVID. You know, how many companies actually benefit and were able to respond um, to change. So that's in a sense agility, right? So what does it mean in the context of uh, agility in construction? Well, it's kind of the same idea, right? How can um, construction companies benefit from constant change, right? The, the world is increasing in complexity. The things are getting messier. They're not getting simpler. So how could a company, um, you know, essentially uh, develop that resilience to change? So that's, you know, agility in construction. And uh, uh, Chrome and I have been talking about like, you know, starting this nonprofit and like, you know, like anytime you talk about starting like, you know, uh, something that's has an idea behind it. And for us, it's like, how can we um, uh, speed up uh, the process of construction companies, you know, adopting some of these things right. lean uh, that have been around for a while. And in that process, we're throwing names and uh, we thought the agility in construction uh, resembled or uh, portrayed, uh, you know, the underlying idea of uh, what we wanted to promote more, I guess. I don't know, Krom. Well, from your perspective, yeah, so you I, I think the vision is really uh, looking at an individual uh, person that's struggling, right? And then uh, uh, you have a team as an individual, you have a team and the, there's been an in, in, increasing amount of information that we're bombarded every day and projects are still two to three years to build, right? There's, there's just a lot of uh, uh, complexity in, in uh uh, not only the systems, but how we manage now that uh, uh, you're dealing with all these different entities, right? So really the vision is really that in the future, individuals and teams can easily adapt to that increasing complexity. And uh, our, 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 again, construction is an easy target because construction has been, um, we've, we've been always compared to uh, uh, the, uh, other industries. And it's just, there's just something in construction that is, that is, uh, uh, I, I can't put my uh, finger on it, but it's like, there's, there's a lot of resistance, right? There, there's a top tier uh, contractors and owners out there uh, and they may just be 10, 20%. There's, there's is a big gap in uh, understanding that how you transform and uh, keep evolving as a company. So it could be a, a, a trade partner, subcontractors, right? And there's just a lot of conventional things. So uh, we're thinking, hey, uh, maybe we collaborate with all these other thought leaders, including you, Felipe, right? You're, you're, right. you're kind of like a star in construction, right? right. And uh, we're thinking, what if, what if we, we collaborate and we, we later, later we'll, 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 we'll all meet and and try to uh, 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 craft our own manifesto, right? As, as, a, as a joint group and it's an open source. And then we can conduct some experiments, right? Do, this, do some research, maybe finance some of those uh, uh, experiments if we can, facilitate workshops, right? So that's, uh, that's agility in construction. I don't know if that's, yeah. that's too much, but. Uh, oh, it's a great, that's a great answer. Cause a lot of people listening and I appreciate both of you Milian and Krom giving me that background because I mean, I know what it is. I live and breathe it every day, but a lot of the people in the, and it's not just unique to construction, many industry, mm -hmm. you're, you're not, uh, you don't wake up and learn about this every day in life. Right. And for some, I, I'd argue, and you can, and anyone can argue against me that we start completely agile and then through conditioning, we become traditional. <laughs> Uh, we lose our agility and then we have to relearn it and rediscover it again. But I want to get, uh, I want to go back to you, Milian, and get your perspective since you're primarily working in other industries. I think your perspective 
looking into construction, working with Crom is going to be priceless. From your outside in view, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see the construction industry has right now? I mean, I think the biggest the biggest issue in construction, and it's not just in construction, it's just like the status quo and you know, like you know trying to to get people to uh, be open to trying different things, right? And understandings like uh, that in each uh, old or traditional world, uh, we had leaders or like this more of a uh, you know command and control, like where we had the people tell us what to do and we would do it. And in the world that we live today, it's more about self-management and self-organization. So the question that you know I ask is like, how many people actually don't want to move to self-management? Because in agile and these uh, uh, approaches that deal with complexity, it's all about self-organization and self-management. But people, you know, when I talk to people, and I think this is the same thing as construction. It's like, well, you know. Um, this is my silo, this is what I've worked, this is what I went to school for, don't ask me to do anything else. Or, you know, when we talk about changing the organizational culture, people talk about culture is this uh, 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 thing, but it's really like, you know, how do we, uh, how do we look at customers and solving customers' problems? And I think uh, that's another thing that, at least from my uh, far view or not as, you know, I'm not as immersed as, as you, uh, is how do we look at the flow and how do we look at all the bottlenecks in organizations? And I think uh, there's a lot of, if I had to look at end-to-end -end flow and value delivery in, in construction, I'm assuming there's so much waste and nobody even knows. It's almost going back to what you said about <laughs> Crum pointing out, like, you know, this is how much this training costs. And that's great. But like, uh, you know, in a sense, like, okay, can we, uh, are we going to internalize what we're learning here? And, you know, what is going to be return on investment from this? Or just even having a discussion rather than going through a motion, hey, we go once a year through these training, let's get it over with, and then we'll move on something else. So I think that's that's that general kind of like the status quo and um, maybe like, as we're all busy, ability to step back and say, how do we continuously improve? And um, maybe just to add something uh, that I've been talking about recently on my podcast and also like agility is like fitness, right? Like, you know, personal fitness. So it's not something like, I'm going to be agile today or I'm going to work, you know, for the next two weeks and I'm going to be agile. And organizations think, oh, we'll kind of adopt these lean practices or agile practices and we'll have teams do it. And, you know, somehow we'll become better or whatever we do. But it's more like fitness where like, you know, it doesn't, you have to have a mindset and it's a lifestyle that you have to embrace, uh, you know, in a sense, like, you know, the lean principles of eliminating waste, right? Um, end to end view. And I think that's something that the construction, at least in, in my opinion, is probably uh, the, the biggest issue. So I don't know, uh, from your perspective, maybe to turn it back to you guys who are close to it, what do you think are the biggest? And, and while Cromwell gets his thoughts together, you know, yeah, uh, let people know that are listening, where can we find your podcast so that we can listen to you know the conversations you're having in agility? Yeah. So right now you can either go to uh, agile2agility.com or just search for on YouTube. Right now it's only on YouTube, I'll have it on other platforms. So if you go to YouTube and just search for agile to agility, um, you should be able to find them. Find All right, them. awesome. Thank and maybe you. you can include it in a, in, a, in a description or something like that. So it's easy Absolutely. To find. We'll absolutely put it in the show notes for, for people, but some people are just listening and driving and they're like, what was that uh, podcast episode? I, I know people. I've been that person, right? <laughs> Especially when you're driving across California. It's a lot of time uh, on the windshield. So Crom agile to agility.com. That's he's trying to call. he's trying to turn the questions on me, but I'm gonna pivot to you first. <laughs> Smart enough not to answer it, huh? I'll answer. Uh, no, it's uh, <laughs> same like uh, just like what Milan's uh, talking about, right? But it's really uh also the uh, you know the trifecta of cost, schedule, and quality, right? And we're always conditioned that uh, you can only have two. Did you remember this, Felipe? Some, mm -hmm. Someone posted this in their, in, their, in their door and I challenged it, right? Yeah. We made it's, a poster, uh, you and I, about this crime. <laughs> so 
how do you that's how do you it. really be reliable and uh, in your schedule and at the same time predictable in your cost because that's that's something that uh, we we in construction uh, so think of the practices right so so we plan and then we stick mm -hmm. to the plan right and you hear this uh, uh, all this mantra of uh, uh, create the plan work the plan right i think there's something missing there right uh, uh, why are you laughing, I'm only laughing. <laughs> that's what you used to say that's no, what because, you used to say <laughs> no, I'm, I'm laughing because when you said that that phrase my mind instantly rolodex like 25 people that have said that exact phrase to me and it's only ever said when the project's behind schedule just <laughs> right uh, how about uh, create the plan inspect the plan and adjust the plan right Never been said before. This, right. this, is so, a, this is a podcast first, ladies and gentlemen. So we stick. We stick to those things. That's that's a that's that's a symptom of a problem, right? Because right. they, they, uh, there's an underlying problem in uh, that the uh, the uh, the people in leadership position. I'm not going to use the word leaders. That no. the people in leadership positions uh, are the experts. So the culture is always about telling. Right, it's a telling culture, and that's as you go through the uh, the why, right? Like, why is this happening? It's really about that. It's really about that, and then it's handed over. It's handed over. Nobody's immune, right? Not a company is immune, because in the 1930s, that's what they do, and then second generation, third, fourth, it's just it's not their fault. It's not it's not uh, their fault. But uh, now our job, our job, right? The problem we're trying to solve here is how do how do we make people see? Just like our journey took us to where we are, and it's hard to unsee, right? right. So the, the guys that I mentor, uh, uh, example here, like in our office, right? I always tell them that first, the first thing, hey, so I got this guy, he's, he's top-notch uh, project manager. He's now into production planning, but before he's, he's doing it, I said, his name's Josh. I said, Josh, whatever you learn, uh, you'll never unsee. You'll never unsee the wasteful things that we do. And so I checked in with him like three, four weeks ago. I said, hey, do you remember that a year ago I told you? He said, oh my God, I can't, you're right. I can't unsee this. So I think that that uh, we need to break that cycle, right? Of the, the telling people what to do by exposing uh, 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 the, uh, 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 be transparent with everything that we have, right? Our work, right? Our thinking, right? Because once we, we do that, the, the telling starts, starts to uh, uh, fade away because now what you're you you got to get the the, the 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 thinking in there right now people start thinking uh, and question uh, so i think the uh, that's the underlying the the unpredictable schedule and the uh, the defective work that we have the uh, uh, unreliable cost right how many Felipe, you were a project manager yeah right yeah change orders are like part it, it's, it's like breathing it's exactly exactly <laughs> like, and, and yeah so, you have to have them <laughs> right so so how do you that that's a symptom of a problem right that you stick right. to something and you don't adjust right now in what we're trying to do if you, we go back to uh, agility in construction is how can we incrementally learn every hour every day so that we don't stick to the plan right we we, we have a plan uh we 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 uh we inspect our work right we inspect our whatever things that we're doing and and uh again in construction we have last planner system and the the uh the last planner system i mean you're familiar with it now right mm -hmm. it's a it's a production uh uh uh, uh process and tool that that we use it's a kanban system limiting work in progress but uh the the thing that uh i see that a lot of uh, 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 practitioners would miss is the uh, the last conversation, because there's there's five conversations in that that system, the last planner system. The last conversation is what did you do, right? That learning cycle on a weekly basis is usually what's missed, and that's inherent in still in our in our culture in construction. So, yeah. I know that makes yeah. sense. Perfect yeah. answer there. Yeah. I it reminded me of a couple of things. So I went to a conference a couple of uh, years ago, just before COVID, and they had like uh, this company was giving out T-shirts where it says like "I plan to be planned," right? And 
And that's kind of, you know, a lot of times we take these estimates and, you know, we take them as commitments, but I think, you know, one, one aspect of construction that's pretty evident is that it's becoming less and less predictable, right? And I think people are trying to embrace and fool themselves that, you know, it's still predictable and just saying like, okay, some aspects of it might be predictable, some may not be, but what do we do here? And I think uh, this happens in other industries as well. I just, just recently worked with actually a company in California and they make, it's a combination of software and hardware. They make essentially robots for the warehouses to move things around, right? Uh, they are one mobile ones, the, the, the one stationary. But one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, is changing for them too, is just like they used to uh, say like, oh, you know, we know we're gonna get this part and we have to wait on it for three weeks. Now that's become, you know, unpredictable too. So they have to think about like, okay, if that part is not gonna end, what can we do to prototype things? Right? How so they've started making like these um, th th these molds and things that like essentially what can we do just to learn even though we don't have the original part but can we do and can we innovate in some way so when that part come that part comes in we'll kind of have some better idea we've learned something that gives us an advantage rather if we just waited or move to another thing to do right and I think that's uh, th that's that idea of uh, of we we might have plans but unexpected things will happen so this goes back to what Crom you were saying in the sense of uh, i think you were alluding to but like uh getting people to start thinking about rather than waiting for managers and having managers tell them what to do like starting for them to think about okay you know this is what the situation is how can i learn something here or get you know the ball moving rather than just hey i'll pick up another thing so that reminded me that the uh, I planned the replan, and uh, that reminded me of uh, no, you know, it's, it's a wonderful approach, right? Yeah. And, and we stick to it because it looks really good. So, so we have all this software. I don't know, like Microsoft projects, P6. You have a plan. So, looks so good. Everybody's there. Everybody's contributing. Everybody goes home at the end of the day. Show up the following day. Plans already behind. Right? Yeah. Just like that, right? Like so. That. How do you how do you get into the predict predict and plan to well, an yeah. inspect and adapt approach, right? I think so I'll be interested to hear your thoughts maybe on this, but like you know, the one one thing that I say, if you want to be predictable, you have to have stability, right? In lean, like if you have high variance and things are changing, it's very difficult to be uh, predictable. So, in what ways? do you have stable teams stable whatever it is like uh, throughput or um uh, whatever you're looking at like you know in order to be predictable you have to have stability in my opinion i don't know if you guys think the same thing it'll be maybe interesting to just uh uh you know spend a little bit on that because i think this always happens and you know in agile or, or like a traditional iron triangle right what's in the middle it's quality so in software we usually uh, you know, compromise on quality because you can in software you can hide quality, right? Um, so I don't know. What are your thoughts yeah. on on the idea of predictability? And you're speaking my love language. Like uh, you don't you don't even know this, but I studied <laughs> uh, statistical process control theory for fun. <laughs> I studied uh, understanding variation and some of the work by William Edward Stemming and others. Yeah, we do have, and and it's really it came to light when I started getting deeper into Agile, particularly in Scrum, when we started looking at these different patterns, uh, like there's a book even called The Spirit of the Game, where there are over 250 patterns to use in agility, particularly in Scrum. Uh, most of them are software specific, but they can be adapted. And uh, for those patterns to even come into existence, they have to be tested for a decade. Yeah. And, uh, and you can get uh, some of the patterns for free online. I'll put a link in the show notes to uh, scrumplop.org so that people can, can find some mm -hmm. of the patterns. And there's some patterns that are really applicable to construction and uh, the variation that uh, you guys are both talking about. But just to paint a picture before we transition to this mindset is construction on very large projects at the billion dollar size and larger. 98% of those projects fail to deliver what the client wanted and 98% of them failed to deliver on time when the thing was needed. So a billion dollars and larger, it's almost a guaranteed failure. 
Now, projects less than a billion dollars, which are the vast majority, and in the United States alone, construction represents about a 2.8 to $3.2 trillion industry any given year. And it's been consistent even through uh, COVID, the pandemic, that number has been consistent for the last five, five-ish years. So $3 trillion, the vast majority of projects are less than a billion. Of those projects, researchers have been studying this because people in the United States are obsessed with productivity and clients are obsessed with why construction costs rise every year. Three out of four projects fail to be delivered on time. Three out of four, 75%. Only 25% of projects less than a billion dollars are delivered on time. And of the 25% that make it, many of those are only completed with heroic efforts where people are working two shifts, three shifts sometimes, overtime weekends, nights, uh, labor up and down, ton of variation, uh, lots of overtime, a lot of tactics that we know don't work uh, for sustained periods of time and definitely have high human cost, a burnout. So that's, that's some of what's wrong with the problem. I think you guys did a great job of hitting on you know, some of the, the causes of those things. So I don't want to beat that dead horse, but for people that don't know the industry that we're in and where that compares to other industries, then the waste factor. So just looking at, let's start with value first, what the client would actually pay for and value for what they deem. I'm going to use the, the textbook definition. Something that is valuable, value added work is something that's information or material that's transformed or a combination of both in a way that the customer finds it valuable, wants it, and would pay for it, period. Mm-hmm. I think I might have a sound effect for that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll just go with that one for now. But you know what, <laughs> Felipe, like you bring up an interesting point because like uh, there were a lot of studies done and like I remember the Standish group that did the study like uh, back in 2012. Still, yeah, and like, yeah, they do a case report every year. But but the thing is, like, I think before Agile, really, until we started taking seriously this iterative incremental approach, like software development, I remember, like, back then, like, they were saying, like, about 75% of software is never rarely used. Right. So when you said that, like, you know, that, that's like just a lot of waste. Like, what we're talking about is just a lot of waste, like, you know, in a sense, like, you know, working on stuff that not adding value to the customer people are you know if i'm building something and not seeing the light of day or i'm seeing that people are not using it's demotivating right i want to see stuff that i'm building that's actually valuable and that people love using it. so i think it has an effect on people and motivation which is another thing where like i don't know what is it in your industry but about 70 75 percent of people in the united states that do knowledge work are disengaged at work yeah, we, we see the same exact values where yeah. people, I, I talked yeah. to somebody just, let me see, it was about four weeks ago, and they were they work actively in construction for a large uh, multi-regional contractor, and yeah. they, were, they were talking about their work in using language that you would hear people in jail use. <laughs> I've only got so many days left. I've got, I've got these many years and these many, and then I'm out. And then, and, and, they, and they said, and then I'm out. And I'm like, that, that's, yeah. Right, uh, problem, you know. That's why so I was, I was, I was yesterday playing golf with uh, Friday with a couple uh, guys, same thing, talking about retirement. Like, and these guys are like five, six, seven younger than me. Yeah, people right? already, and the guy that I was talking same to, sentence. younger than me. He was, he was younger than me, talking about how many years he has left. I don't think that way, but the, but you're totally right. It's the Gallup poll that surveys people on engagement at the workplace, and. It, and we know that engagement is sub 70% across almost all industries worldwide. Right. And, and, and it's, it's, it's sad, you know, like, just you know, we talk about. Part. I just, got, I just got my last little nerd out and then I'm gonna, I'll let you go back. But for people that don't know, like researchers have tried to pin down in construction, like how much is value add versus waste? And it's hard depending on what study you read, but the consensus is somewhere between 50% to 80% of all actions taken in design and construction does not produce value. Let it's me repeat more than that. Yeah. 50 it's it's way a, more than that. It's a range. And Cromwell's right. We know that it's higher when you're in no, it. No, no, it's uh, the waste is more. Yeah. The waste is more, yeah. but uh, yeah. research, they, they argue on what it is. And when you introduce the design part, the numbers skew more, but it's somewhere between half of what we do 
Right. But to more than three quarters of what we do, probably 80% does not produce value. If the customer had a choice to pay for what you were doing or forced to do, they would say, no way, don't do it. Like <laughs> eight out of eight out of 10 things that you do, they would not want you to do. And in the value stream, people down the stream from you that receive your work, same for them. We do a lot of things that, that doesn't, okay, now I'm going to get off my my soapbox, uh, <laughs> but you're like, you seem to be a, passionate about this thing. It's, yeah, no, it's really interesting. Why, why, why are you getting like, angry now? Like, yeah. no. <laughs> he sees waste and he gets angry. Oh my, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's like, I see waste everywhere. It's not like small amounts of waste. I think oh, it's, it's, just, it's like, it, it's like, it, it's, it, and I see this in government. I see this everywhere. It's like, you know, how, if we're just like, I feel like if we just adopted some of these simple principles, like visualizing, like understanding end to end, like flow delivery, organize. This is another thing that, that uh, I, I definitely wanted to talk about, but like organizational structure, right? Organizing by products and like minimizing the handoffs, minimizing the, you know, how like lack of understanding of, you know, what value is and how we deliver it. And I, I I agree with you, Philippe. It, it, it's 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 demoralizing to see how much is <laughs> you know just non-value added stuff. And, right. Uh, it's the, and the only it's reason bad. I get so mad, and Cromwell knows he's stayed up with me many late night, uh, and we've had many late night conversations talking about this <laughs> because time is limited. Like the time that we yeah. have every day to do things is absolutely at some point I have to go to sleep at some point I have mm. to recharge my battery and it's not unique to me. It's everybody. And, and so many people have their time wasted every day on just things. And it's not nefarious reasons of why their time is wasted. It's just how the system is set up. And what you just, uh. what you just hit on Milian on talking about organizational structure, you know, the everyday person listening to the show doesn't have enough awareness of, you know, a systems approach. And I heard, I heard Dave Stone on your podcast just rip systems apart, which I thought, <laughs> which was awesome. how he talked about how most people get it wrong, and and they do, and they do get it wrong. But I think you know what are some things that people listening to the show, where can we let's bring it home to the people listening? What can they do? What what from Lean? What from Agile? Can they bring into their to their work tomorrow? Or today, if if it's the, if they're driving in listening to the show, hey, if you're driving in listening to the show, <laughs> thank you for listening, and uh, don't right. be afraid to hit a like. You know, it's not going to kill you when you're safe, not while you're driving. When you're in a safe yeah. spot, hit the like button and share the show with a friend. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I think you got to keep it simple, right? So for for those that are listening, <laughs> I, I think uh, you have to start where you are, right? Meaning, if you're a project engineer start within your influence. And if you're a vice president, start within your influence. And um, just again, start with simple things like probably the number one thing is just exposing thinking and exposing work. And, and from there, you can now uh, rally around uh, the problem, right? So, so you, you can organize around the product. So that's what we do, right? We, we, we productize with the product. In, in your case, if you wanna start something, uh, starting where you are means um, start organizing around problems. So let's say if you're a project engineer and you're struggling with something, um, look for the people that are affected by the problem and then start exposing the problem. Alan Mulally would say, you cannot manage a secret, right? It's hard to manage a secret. So expose the secret, use, use this, let me look for it here. Post-it notes, right? If you don't have anything, expose it. And from there, you, you, you craft and agree on the problem statement. My experience in construction, we're very good at proposing solutions, right? So that's not the problem. The solutions are not the problem, there's a lot out there. The problem is when you when you don't know where to start and you're you're not as a team agreeing on the problem you're trying to solve. And that's when agility would come in when you start proposing all these things because uh, you may have five different proposals and you don't know which one to start and you just all agree, let's start one and then let's just adjust, right? 
and then suddenly you now know how to work with each other and then yeah i think that's the simplest probably the first step right start where you are beautiful how about you uh William? so maybe i've been thinking uh, in a sense of you know uh, what is the biggest issue like over the last 20 years and this is maybe not the, for the listener but maybe just for for their bosses and their bosses um uh, on my podcast and just in general i've been asking people like what is the percentage of these agile adoptions you know people going back to like this is why we're doing this and then you know what's the sex success rate and it, it, it's close to zero right for a lot of these and the the, the follow-up question that i ask is well what's needed for the organizational change or organization to become uh responsive or agile whatever it is and it really has to do with the executives and leadership all the way up. So if you don't have leaders that are thinking systemically, that are willing to take a look at everything and say like, we have to change the structure, we have to you know help and develop people, we have to, it really uh, is difficult to do just bottom up. Right. And a lot of times, you know, what I'm seeing, and it's probably same in, in construction where like this is something that teams do. So unless the leadership buys in from the top and understands how to create an ecosystem, you're going to be stuck. And this is where, you know, for the last 10 years, most companies, you know, agile don't confuse being popular with success rate. And I think, you know, companies that adopt these agile approaches, they don't go back to waterfall do. But they also don't like, you know, going back to waste, there's still so much waste, even though they've improved and minimized what it was, you know, before, there's still plenty. So I think uh, get your leadership, if you can influence and Krom alluded to like leadership is not just, you know, people that have bigger checks than you. It, it, it's really at all levels. And uh, my message would be like try to like organize communities or practice um get leaders you know a lot of times i recently worked with a leader um j just like 10 minutes finding those people that get it and then having them influence their peers can do uh, uh, magical things in a sense of influencing across organizations so um everything that Krom said but in addition i i think uh, uh, the the a lot of times what's forgotten is that unless you have that enablement and ecosystem for teams, uh, everything becomes ten times harder. Right. So. It, it is my favorite, right? Yeah, yeah. Just do it. I'm gonna support you, right? Yeah. So I think in addition, right? So now you have to start where you are. Get the leaders uh, really educated, right? If they want change, they have to be educated, right? Edward W. Yeah. Deming know what to do and then do your best, right? Leaders, when they say, I support you, you're just being tolerated. You're just being tolerated, right? If they don't know how to support you. So Milan, that's a, that's a great uh, uh, yeah, the, advice. The two of you together are powerful. It's, uh, and, and you said before too, and I don't know which one of you, I can't remember. You said too, make things visible. So make, mm -hmm. make the problems visible. Go grab that, grab the boss because Krom, you don't want to say leader. So like we'll use uh Millian's language, grab the boss, go and see the problem yeah. together, and then start where you are together. Don't do you don't have to go by yourself. Don't do it by yourself. It's a team, team sport. Have fun with teams. I love that. I love that. So now I want to go, let's let's turn, let's turn it up a little bit and go a little bit harder yeah. now. So turn it up to eleven. Yeah, we're gonna go all the way to eleven. <laughs> for those of you still old enough to know what that reference is. <laughs> I'm sure the Gen Z has got it down on the meme game. They know what it means to turn it up to 11. <laughs> so uh, in, we'll go back to systems for a second. You know, organizational structure, we talked about a little bit, and there definitely are policies that hold people back. What What's an example of that so that people might not be aware that they're operating inside of a policy that's preventing them from having throughput and flow? Um, so an example would be any anytime you have a handoff, right? Like if you... Um, uh, I don't know what would be example I can give you in software development, some other industries. Yes, um, give us one in but, software but, and we'll tell you the core. I'll give you one in software and some, but like the idea of like uh, customer doesn't uh, like, I don't care if you're like saying you're done 
uh, with the software or feature, let's just say payment system. I ask you, I want to now be able to pay with cryptocurrency. When can you make it done? You know, when can I start using it? Because as soon as I can start offering that, I can start making more money. So as a customer, I don't care if you tell me, well, it's 99% done, but it's not live, or it's tested, but in this environment, it's not in that environment. And a lot of times what we have in software development is these handoffs. You have somebody that's responsible for requirements, then somebody will design or develop, then testing, then there's like a bunch of different testing. And then we don't trust these people to, to release it. So you have like a <laughs> release department that's uh, making sure that you know nobody messes up things. So when we look at it now, at least in more mature software development companies, we look at it end to end. How can we create and have dedicated team that can de deploy that request as quickly as possible to production. So uh, another example would be the, recently I mentioned with the client uh, working, like if you have a, somebody that comes to you and says, uh, I need a specific robot for this specific thing in my warehouse, right? Your client doesn't care if you have to wait three weeks for a part from China, whatever. They're, they're trying to solve their problem. So if we look at how we organize in our company, by products or in some way, you know, however, that we can get uh, what customer wants. And a lot of times they don't know what they want. So you might have to deliver and they're gonna say, yep, that's what I asked for, but now <laughs> I, I need this tweaked, right? So it, it's that idea of how do we understand end to end and how are we actually talking to the customer to help them solve their problem? So that would be maybe my example, Krom, you probably- Yeah, and so very related, very related to what yeah. you're saying. So it's really the uh, the systems usually have an architecture, right? The system is designed to produce something, right? And you you, you usually get you you usually get that, right? So if you look at the hierarchy, right? A hierarchy has uh, some advantages, right? Because the the uh, the uh, your career path is clear, right? Your uh, it everything is you don't have to think, right? I mean it's it you know how it works like i report to somebody that somebody reports to somebody right but mm -hmm. then really that hierarchy is very slow right and this is where it's not agile right it's it's like the uh, pyramid of giza right it's uh, rigid it's robust right but when god forbid right there's going to be an act of terror it doesn't matter if what if it stood 5000 years right it's going to be destroyed so I think uh, looking at your systems, and people talk about this, it's just so hard to implement, right? Is uh, mm -hmm. creating network amongst your teams, right? And, and maybe that becomes a, a policy that that's the secondary operating system. So you have your primary hierarchy that you need for efficiency, but that's no longer enough, right? It, it, it has to be uh, yeah, organizing around what Milan's alluding to is, don't organize around your departments, right? Or organize around the value or, stream. Yeah. Yeah. Organize around the value stream. And because the value stream is where networks are created. You can see the loops, right? So if you think of a value stream map, it always starts from a customer, goes to a, 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 a production system. And I'm now talking manufacturing talk. And then from the, from, from the production uh, uh, system, it, it goes into the... Uh, uh, the steps and how you create value, right? But you can see that there's different loops that you you go through, right? From from the, uh, the the customer and the delivery and where you pull from that that uh, what we call the pace setter in your in your in your value stream. So, I think looking at your uh, hierarchy and then creating a secondary uh, operating system of a team of teams as a network. Is something that uh, can be. Uh, that's, yeah, and the that's idea. That's you attack, yeah, and, right? yeah, and I think the idea of systems is so broad that, like, you know, in a sense, like, you know, where do you start? But the, uh, uh, it, it's really like that there are a lot of interrelated parts, and that uh, the building itself, right, might be pretty stable and, like, you know, once it's built, but the process of actually. Uh, uh, making that building <laughs> into that stable structure is a very, you know, complex endeavor and how you, the system to, to deliver that uh, needs to be, I guess, you know, uh, 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 designed in a way 
that you can solve the problem. And, uh, you know, uh, one major part is that you have to start the project with assumption that it's unpredictable or that there's some aspect of it unpredictability. Right. So depending I mean, on the like, face, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. So the environment, depending on the environment. Now, now we're going back to Snowden, right? What is the environment, right? Exactly. Right. Simple or complex, environment. Is it? Yeah. So maybe like, you know, just to conclude is that a lot of times and, you know, the Miami Chrome is like, you know, contextualizing, you know, it's not just, you know, one approach or the other, but actually understanding what type of system are we working, what are we trying to do, and then contextualizing our tools right. in a way like if we're in desert, <laughs> we, we, we probably need different tools than if we're in forest. And it seems like in most industries, it's one toolbox for everything. So. Right, right. It's really like, I don't know, you guys play golf, right? It's like playing golf. You have 14 clubs and every situation, it's a different club. At the same time, it's a different, the process of using the club is different, right? If you're under a tree, which we are always, right? <laughs> you have that slice. Me, yeah, if you're playing with me, Kron, we will be under right. a tree. <laughs> so what my point is, my point is the, the processes and tools are really, are, are, are there, but that's not going to give you agility, right? What gives you agility is how you use the, how you use the process of tools in the context of the situation, right? Because once you're like in our manufacturing, once we start manufacturing, that becomes a, a, a simple environment, right? Where we can apply our best practices. But before mm -hmm. that, before that, all the prototyping and everything we do, there's, there's, we're, we're, we're going to be in a complicated environment where we just adapt our good practices. But during design, Design is a is a complex environment, right? Not not only and, not only because design would move. It's like you're dealing with people, and, and when they're having a bad day, right? It just, this design is is in the in a complex or chaotic environment. So, I think understanding those things uh, as you're you're trying to change your system. I think both of you are you're hitting on it from coming in at different angles, and I, I like it. You know, for the listener. What they're describing is with this network or this team of teams approach for the systems, have some conversations with people you work with or inside and, and reach out to the two of these individuals as well. And I always encourage everybody to reach out to me with questions. Uh, if you want to learn more about this or, or you know where to get started with this, there are, there are better and less good entry points depending on where you're at. But there are probably people that you work with that would be willing to network with you and start to play in these different areas. And that's now where... We're starting to talk about culture and how organizational culture could look. And we talked about agility quite a bit. We talked about lean. And I love that Cromwell said, what problem are you trying to solve? I'll let uh, Pete know that I owe him 20 yeah. items because I lost the bet because he brought it up before I could. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll have to pay him. But I want to get back into something a little more technical. And I think this uh, came from you, Crom, where you talked about possibly you know, having four different lenses to look at what we do, or is that uh, from Bilian? It's from the book down, right? And essentially it's based on this concept of like uh, the whole organization could be looked at from these four lenses. Um, and uh, really it's uh, think about it as, as being part the mindset and culture. So if we have uh, a mindset and culture, um, uh, is really how do we adopt the values principle, how we think, how you know, do we behave. And then the other uh, right side, if you think about it, is for uh, a window with four uh, parts. Um, so on the left side, you have uh, mindset and culture. On the other one, you have practices, behavior, and systems, which is the organizational structure. So to give you an example, if you have a leader that has a mindset that is willing to restructure the company, uh, more to product-based structure, right? Then they'll try to uh, look at their hierarchy and the silos and they're going to say, well, what are the products? Let's organize by products, right? Well, once you organize by products, there are certain practices that align with those products. Like how are we going to, if we have three teams working together on the same product, what type of practices, how are they going to synchronize, right? So between the systems, uh, mindset, and, and practices, those are the three kind of the lenses that I described as uh, influencing the culture. Um, so I don't know, like, Chrome. Uh, no, this is actually yeah, where we yeah. hit off each other, right? Yeah. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to look for that picture because I think I took a photo. So I, 
Milan started to talk about this, I started drawing because I was focused more on practices and mindsets. And Milan's a little ahead of this kind of thing. So, uh, so I remember the iceberg analogy that I, I draw is like, hey, there's things that you see and there's things you don't see, right? And then your, your, your values and, and shared mm-hmm. values and uh, invisible norms, like beliefs and thinking you don't see, right? right. So that, that's, that's, I think that's where the culture is, right? You don't see it, but uh, you can see systems and architecture but there's things you don't see that are more more dangerous, right? Because if you don't share the same values, that's everything will fall apart, right? So anyway, I think I don't. It's, it's a know. very it's a very yeah. I guess it's a very complex topic uh, to look at the whole organization and see how do we uh, we can't just focus on changing the practices. We have to look at the right. culture, mindset of people, and also organizational structure. Um, so there's really, I know we're pretty close to finishing. There's not really a quick way, or at least we're, <laughs> I don't have a quick way to explain besides what I did earlier, but you just have to do it your way, Milian. Don't do it the yeah. quick way. Do it the slow, yeah. the slow, yeah. predictable way. Yeah. Trust yourself. Go for it. Yeah. Well, it's just, the, it, it goes back to that, uh, depending on the leadership, if we, if you have leadership that craves control, right? they're going to tend to generally create structures that are more, you know, I don't know how it is in your, but like a lot of people that are ego-driven and, uh, you know, most organizations will want to be head of a department or it used to be like, you know, depending on how many people report to me, that's, you know, how uh, my paycheck is determined or how my influence is determined. So if you have leaders that won't change their mindset to change the structure, because like a lot of this has to go with letting go of their, you know, <laughs> influence or, or their ego, uh, then that's going to reinforce the culture of silos and functions, right? So there's this mindset. If you have leaders that are willing to restructure their organization by products and flatten the organization, then you're going to get a structure that's more like what, uh, Chrome said like more of a network and less uh, 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 more focused on delivery, right? So th- those are, I think maybe if I had to, uh, those are the two things that go back to the leaders. Um, the, the behavior, right? Like a lot of times if you have uh, uh, leaders that are uh, uh, not walking the walk, like for instance, I expect you Felipe to visualize your work, but we won't visualize our work you know you do agile or these approaches but you know it's not for us yep. right so that's that behavioral part so those three between the mindset uh, mindset and uh, structure and uh, uh, behaviors that's going to kind of influence what type of culture you have and what kind of uh, you know norms uh, and shared beliefs you have so um, I have to work on this in a sense that I don't have a very succinct way to explain it as I'm learning more and more about it but uh, maybe as the biggest takeaway is just uh, look at your organization holistically. Don't just look at the practices, but look at the, you know, how people think about solving problems, what type of behaviors solve, support that thinking, and then how does the flow in organization, where are the handouts, where are the bottlenecks? Can, can that I would add, be... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, Milan, you, you hit the nail there. Yeah. So most organizations, they have their like what, what are our values, right? That's why it's forced upon us, right? So like in our case, we have three values and some companies have three values, right? Some have five mm-hmm. and they're trying to rally around those values, right? Because values would would be a rallying point. And then that's, again, it it's the collective thinking, right? Of the organization. And I think that's that's culture. That's, and the, the, again, you, you can't see it, so. I think that's where the challenge is. Yeah, I do this. I do this fun exercise in, in a training, essentially where like I walk people through these four value, four four lenses, and essentially they pick what they do in each of these lenses. Like you know, what type of leadership do we have? What type of structures, right? And uh, essentially, uh, at the end of this exercise, uh, you know, the general uh, uh, feedback is now I know why my organization is so fucked up. <laughs> and, and I don't know if we can swear here, but that's really like 
Yeah, this it, is it, not it, uh, it, safe for it, children. This is an adult. It, this, yeah. is, this podcast it, it, is it, it's, like, That's really adults. like what, the, and I remember, you know, one of the guys is specifically saying that recently, like now that now things make sense, right? Like now I know. Um, so, uh, so, so I don't know, uh, maybe you can provide it. I have written about this. Uh, I'm actually doing a short video uh, on these four lenses and I'm writing a book on it. So hopefully by the end of this year, that'll be out too. But um, it's a holistic way to look at the organizational change uh, through these four lines. Thank you both so much for spending mm-hmm. your time with me on your OT, your own time. <laughs> and I want to give uh, each one of you the last words before I play the music. But uh, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been my, it's been an absolute treat having the two of you on together, talking about one of my most favorite topics in the whole world, agility. Uh, thank you for having us. This has been fun. And I feel like we, you know, what's tough with these podcasts is like, you know, uh, uh, it, there are time blocks uh, and uh, there's a lot that we could be talking about. But thank you for having us on as a, as a last word. Um, uh, relentless improvement. I think, uh, you know, a lot of times people talk about improvement, but uh, what I've seen the team that succeed and are really good is they relentlessly look at how they can improve. So don't just talk about improvement uh, relentlessly, you know, focus on improving all the time. So. Now, Felipe, thank you for having us. Milhan, I mean, this is, this is a, uh, I enjoy talking about this kind of thing. So I told Milhan, don't worry about content. We have five days of content, right? Oh, that's right. Um, I think for me, it's really just, uh, uh, expose the work, expose what you think, and uh, write it down, and then let everybody see what you're thinking. And from there, let's let's talk about where we want to go together. So show the problem. This is our problem, right? That we are the only ones that can solve, right? Uh, collectively, uh, if you expose things, there's, there's it opens up a lot of possibilities. And maybe just last, uh, maybe invitation to the listeners and others, like, uh, we're trying to create a platform. We're organizing conference, uh, Crum and I, through this agility and construction organization. We're trying to create more awareness and um, bridge more of uh, people for construction and other industries. Because I think if we just reflect back of how much like Deming and like what came out of Toyota with Toyota production system influence other industries and Agile was born out of that, that we can learn from each other. And there's a lot that we've learned in software development over the last 20 years. So connect with us, connect with other professionals. There's a lot that we can learn from each other and help each other. So that's my invitation. Very special thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe Engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build.